Greetings, friends around the world. This is Dr. Bob Teal for the Bible News Prophecy Channel. Could globalism be the new Tower of Babel? You know, like the Tower of Babel from the Bible? Well, Ted Mollick seems to think so. Ted Mollick reportedly was actually one time considered to be a candidate to be the U.S. ambassador to the European Union. But the European Union uh, people, they were opposed to it. They didn't want him to be part of it. And he wrote an article which titled, Globalism is the New Tower of Babel. And I'd like to read some things that uh, he wrote in this particular article. The Tower of Babel in Hebrew language was real. Today, that Tower of Babel is the European Union and other globalist organizations. Globalists in the European project have been building their tower for decades. Their punishment of Europe has been biblical in scale. Babel is part of the biblical literature and is recorded in the book of Genesis 11, 1 through 9. In truth, it represents the sinful pride of mankind, an act of ultimate hubris, wanting to reach the heavens where mankind could become gods themselves. This warning has been ignored by the Eurocrats in Brussels and Strasbourg. They speak of building a European empire, with your sons and daughters drafted into the European army, going off to die for Angela Merkel. Setting aside all tradition, all past customs, often rewriting history, and most notably eradicating the nation state, these globalists and the crony capitalists and socialists that fund them and are, do all their doings seek one thing, the power to control. Well, that's pretty brash. Well, in the same article, Ted Mollett goes and he quotes something written decades ago by former National Security Advisor, United States, Zygmunt Brzezinski. And I'd like to read something Brzezinski wrote in a book uh, back in the 20th century. The technotronic era involves the gradual appearance of a more controlled society. Such a society would be dominated by an elite, unrestrained by traditional values. Soon it will be possible to assert almost continuous surveillance over every citizen and maintain up-to-date complete files containing even the most personal information about the citizen. Well, since that was written, more technology has gone into place, and we also have things like cell phones that uh, can keep track of where you are, etc. Well, getting back to Ted Mollick, uh, who quoted that, he also wrote, this new order would be neither democratic nor representative. Like the Tower of Babel, today's acts of global arrogance run contrary to the very nature of man. Defeating it will allow the flourishing of a new Europe of sovereign nations. Nimrod's tower fell, as did Alexander's, Cyrus's, Attila's, Napoleon's, Hitler's, Stalin's, and Mao's. They all fall. The EU is next. Is the EU going to fall, or is it going to become something like the Tower of Babel? Before I get to that, I want to quote something that was in the Jerusalem Post. This is written by a rabbi by the name of Anshi Shloma. And let me read some of what he wrote. We are not returning to the biblical Tower of Babel. That was a disaster of uniformity and totalitarianism. The world is meant to be a diverse place and languages are diverse. The global ambitions of the Jacobins and the Jihadis are doomed to fail. We must fight the totalitarian impulse and stand up for our culture, our heritage, and our identity. Now, truly, we should stand up for the truth of the Bible. But the Bible warns that a totalitarian society is going to come to pass. And is Europe actually building the Tower of Babel? Well, Ted Mollick says it was, but it's going to be defeated. Well, the Bible says it'll get defeated, but not until after it gets beyond where it already is. I'd like to read something from the book of Revelation. We we'll talk about the fact that we're going to see something rise up with totalitarian control. The book of Revelation, chapter 13, starting in verse 15, and I'm going to be reading from the New King James Version of the Bible. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it's the number of a man. His number is 666. Revelation 13 basically describes both a religious and political alliance and one that can control buying and selling. This was not possible from a practical perspective when the, uh, Apostle John was inspired or told to write down the book of Revelation but it is now, modern society.
Now, in Revelation chapter 17, we see the term Babylon brought up again. So let's go and read about this. This is Revelation 17, starting in verse 1. Then I saw one of the seven angels had seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come and I'll show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk by the wine of her fornication. Now before going further, you see some kind of a compromise between a, a compromised church, we call the harlot here, and nations of the world, kings of the world. Now we'll go to verse 3. So they carried me away in the spirit in the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunk of the blood of the saints, and the blood of the martyrs is Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled in great amazement. So John sees this. He thinks, wow, this is something big. What's going, what's going on here? And he'll get an explanation here. And I'll just cut down to verse 9 on the explanation. Here's the mind of wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains in which the woman sits. There are also seven kings. Now, you say, okay, he saw this kind of stuff. But we don't really see this currently in Europe. That's correct, because Europe, Europe is going to reorganize. And we can see this in verses 12 and 13. Verse 12 first. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings, which received no kingdom as, of, as yet, but they received authority for one hour as kings with the beast. So we're seeing some type of reorganization. This could be a regional change. For example, combining several small nations in Europe into one region or to go across national borders and put something in one country or something in something else. And you say, okay, so, well, how do we know it would be totalitarian? Well, they're going to give power to the beast. We can read about this in verse 13. These are of one mind, and they will give their power and authority to the beast. And later, by the way, verse 14, which I might read, it talks about having, they're going to actually fight against Jesus, and Jesus is going to to beat them. And now, as far as this idea about Babylon and a, and a beast, one of the times when my wife and I were in Greece, I picked up a two-year-old Greek coin. And if you see this coin, on one side of it, you see a woman riding the beast. Now, the woman is called Europa, by the way, from Greek mythology. And that's actually where Europe gets its uh, name. Now, as far as the Tower of Babel goes, Let's go and read about the incident back in the book of Genesis. You're probably somewhat familiar with it, but let's go through this a little bit of this anyway. Genesis chapter 11. we we'll start with verse 1. Now the whole earth had one language and one speech. And came to pass, they journeyed from the east, and they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Then they said to one another, Come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone, and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, Come, let's build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let's make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. Now God had told the people to scatter abroad, but they didn't want to listen. So this is their pride and arrogance. says, Okay, we're going to build our own system. We're going to build this building. It's going to go up to heaven. We won't worry about a flood again, because this came after the, the flood. But God was not pleased with this. You can see that out of verse 5. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. Then the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, they have one language. This is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they propose will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language, that they may not be able to understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased to build the city. Therefore, its name is called Babel, because the Lord confused their language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the earth. Now, as far as languages go, the European Union actually has 24 official languages, and actually uses something like the Tower of Babel for uh, symbolism. If you see here, the European Parliament building is Strasbourg, France. It looks like a partial building for the Tower of Babel. Furthermore, years ago, 
Europe put out a poster, a European Union poster, showing basically the Tower of Babel, saying that they were going to have one voice. Now, God, of course, eventually stopped the Tower of Babel. He's also eventually going to stop what's going on in Europe. We can go to the book of Revelation, chapter 18, and read a little bit about that. In verse 1, After these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority. The earth was illuminated with his glory. And he cried with a mighty voice, saying, Babylon, the greatest fall, has fallen. It has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, a cage for every unclean bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues. For her sins have reached the heavens, to heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Render to her just as she rendered to you. Repay her double according to her works. And the cup which she has mixed makes double for her. In the measure which she glorified herself, lived luxuriously, in the same measure give her torment and sorrow. For she says in her heart, I said as a queen, I am no widow, and will see no sorrow. Therefore her plagues will come in one day. Death and mourning and famine. She will be utterly burned with fire. For strong is the Lord God who judges her. Well, Europe has a lot of ties to the woman and the beast, a city of seven hills, and all, and all these type of things. It isn't that human cooperation cannot be a good thing, but similar to what happened in the time of the Tower of Babel, they didn't want to do it God's way. What they're going to end up doing in Europe is not going to be according to God's way. And they need, people need to repent, accept the good news of the kingdom of God, and in this age, live according to God's way and repent. But we don't expect that to happen based on biblical prophecies and what we see going on in the world. Now, oddly, there are actually some writings from Eastern Orthodox and Roman Catholic sources that are looking forward to this coming Babylon. Really? Uh, yes, I'd want to read something first from the Eastern Orthodox. Let me read something here from Monk Leontios. He died in 543. Rejoice! O most unhappy one, O new Babylon, you who are the new Babylon, now rejoice on behalf of Zion. New Babylon, dance, bounce, and leap greatly. Make known even those in Hades what a grace you've received, because that peace which was yours to enjoy in times past, which God has deprived you of in the course of battles, receive it once more from the hand of the angel. O the city of seven hills, the dominion will be yours. By the way, we read about the city of seven hills in Revelation chapter 17. The Bible says that's not going to last. Yet we have an Eastern Orthodox prophecy saying this is a good thing. It's coming Babylon. And sadly, many who are, will be associated with that particular religion are going to think this is a good thing. Well, what about the Church of Rome? It's based in a city of seven hills. And actually their cathedra, uh, they're the place where they say they have succession from is actually not in Vatican City. It's in St. John's Lateran, which is next to one of the seven hills or within the seven hills of Rome. Well, anyway, I'd like to read a prophetic writing from their abbot uh, Joachim, who died in 1202. A remarkable pope will be seated on a pontifical throne under the special protection of the angels. Holy and full of gentleness, he shall undo all wrong. He shall cover, recover this states of the church to reunite the exiled temporal powers. As the only pastor, he shall reunite the eastern to the western church. This holy pope will be both a pastor and reformer. Through him, the east and the west shall be in everlasting concord. The city of Babylon shall then be the head and the guide of the world. Rome, weakened in temporal power, shall forever preserve her spiritual domin do dominion and shall receive great peace. At the beginning of the order, in or, at the beginning, in order to bring these happy results, having need of a powerful assistance, this holy pontiff will ask for cooperation of the generous monarch of France, the great monarch. So we see prophecies from the Eastern Orthodox Catholics and Roman Catholics that coming Babylon is good. By the way, both the, the Eastern and Roman Catholics, Eastern Orthodox and Roman Catholics, have prophecies about this great monarch riding up, rising up. Uh, we have sermons at the Continuing COG channel that you can watch about them, but basically 
This particular leader, the great monarch, has a lot of similarities to the beast Revelation warns about, as well as the king of the north that Daniel warns about in Daniel chapter 11. Now as far as globalism goes, the Bible shows that it's going to be defeated. It's not that every aspect of cooperation is wrong. It's not. But what they're trying to build, like the Tower of Babel, is they're trying to do something not God's way. And this will be defeated. You go to Revelation chapter 11, I want to read verse 18. The nations were angry, it, your wrath has come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that you should reward your servants, the prophets, and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. So Jesus is going to return, and people are going to be angry. And he's going to uh, punish the nations for rebelling against him. And we can also read about this in Revelation chapter 19, starting in verse 11. Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. And we'll skip down to verse 14. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth was a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads on the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he, he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Before I go any further, some writings from, I think, the Eastern Orthodox say this is a prophecy for the, their great monarch. He's king of kings and lords and lords. And no, this is clearly just for Jesus, but they, I've read writings that say, no, this is not just for him. They're misunderstanding what's going to happen. And we get back to this. I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in heaven, come, gather together for the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, and those who sit on the flesh of all people, both free and slaves, small and great. And I saw... The beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. So yes, the book of Revelation says there will be basically a global force that's going to fight against Jesus. Again, I'm not against cooperation. People should cooperate and not kill one another. But the Bible warns that what's going to happen with what we could call globalism, if you will, is that they're going to fight against uh, the returning Jesus. If you continue in Revelation 19, it, along with other passages in the book of Rev Revelation, shows that this globalist power, this new Tower of Babel, if you will, is going to be destroyed. So human attempts for globalism, the way they're going about it, apart from the word of God, will be defeated. Uh, both the uh, rabbi in the Jerusalem Post and Ted Mollett Wallach Malik were saying that uh, we have to fight, you know, this isn't going to happen. Well, they, they can be opposed to it, but it's still the Bible says it's going to happen, unless basically most of the world will repent. And those things are going to happen. So what are we seeing happening now? We are seeing the beginnings, if you will, of perhaps making the bricks in order to put together uh, the end time Tower of Babel. But it's not going to stay around. It will be defeated. Jesus will return. And while the nations of the world will fight against him and be defeated, the good news is Jesus will come to establish the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God will make this world better than what the globalists tell all the rest of us that they're trying to do. Because it's only through living God's way and doing things God's way that we'll get the type of utopia that humans have longed for since Adam and Eve were put out of the Garden of Eden. This is Dr. Bob Teal for the Bible News Prophecy Channel.